Hey guys, Ken Smith, Ken Smith Fishing. This is going to be the last video in the Todd Driscoll series. It's a longer video because I had about 20 minutes worth of material left or, or footage left and I didn't want to break it into two little short videos. So bear with us. But this is the video of why I wanted to meet with Todd in the first place. And that is to talk about the direct oxygen injection system for your live well. A way that we can pretty much stop killing the vast majority of the fish that are dying. The link to his presentation is going to be on my YouTube channel in the in the description below, so you can go find that there. But before we go there, uh, a couple of other things going on I want to mention to you guys. Uh, so we'll be back down at the lake this next weekend. Uh, we'll be fishing the Labor Day out, uh, Outlaw Outdoors tournament uh, next Monday. Dickie and I are going to fish it together. This is open to anybody. Todd Faircloth, I know you've fished some of this stuff before. Bring your son and come fish. Ben Jarrett. Bring your son down there. I saw those fancy bell-bottom 80s uh, 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 Skeeter pants you had on on Facebook the other day. Whip those bad boys out, drive your Good Times van down there with your Skeeter behind it and come fish with us. This should be a lot of fun. So we'll be there uh, on Monday fishing that tournament. Upcoming tournaments, let's look at a couple of things. So this one is the uh, the College National Tournament. I'm going to make sure I get this right, so bear with me for one second here. Okay, this is directly from, sorry, I messed this up about five times. This is your chance. This is from Clint Wade. Okay, here we go, from Clint Wade, Tournament Director. Uh, here's your chance to qualify for the Bassmaster College National Championship. Don't forget, someone from that tournament will get to fish the Bassmasters Classic. It's only a $100 entry fee and a $100 side pot, but both of those are 100% payback. And unlike some other college tournaments, this is payback directly to the anglers. So not going to your college, you pay the entry fee, you or your college pays the entry fee, you get to take the, the, uh, the money. Last year, uh, we had, uh, or earlier this year actually, was that last year or earlier this year? I guess it was last year. We had 60 entries. We had a lot of fun. You see on here, uh, I do some MC work on this tournament. So I sort of wander the crowd. Uh, don't show up and not know a little bit about your college history because there's every chance in the world you're going to get some questions asked from yours truly. So we're going to have a lot of fun, I promise you. Uh, like we did last year, we'll be grading you uh, A, B, C, D, or fail on the boat ramp in the morning, according to how good you are back in your truck. So if, if any of your buddies fish this tournament, ask them. We had a really, really good time. This is not your normal bass fishing tournament. So that tournament, there's two of them this year. Uh, there's going to be one on September 28th out of Umphreys and another one on November 16th out of Umphreys. Come fish them, guys. We're going to have a heck of a lot of fun at those tournaments. And we're going to do some stuff. I'm not going to tell you what it is yet, but we're going to do some stuff at the, uh, at the weigh-in that's different than anything you've ever seen before. So come join us there. All right, next thing we want to talk about. Okay, next tournament I want to talk about is the Average Joe Tournament. I get so many guys, especially the North Texas guys, and hey guys, I don't blame you. Look, I drive all the way from Richardson to Rayburn to fish. We've got a house down there, but I am not a local. It is hard to compete with those guys down there. So this is a tournament where you want to come to Rayburn and fish a tournament and not compete against those local hammers, this is a tournament for you. So the Average Joe Tournament, September 29th, it's a Sunday tournament, $165 entry fee. Uh, it will be a trailering event, but here's the deal. If you and your partner have won 2000 bucks on Rayburn this year, and you, the rules are here, you can see uh, it's you know combined 2000 bucks or more, you can't fish this tournament. So this truly is for those of you who have not done well in tournaments at Rayburn, don't fish a lot of tournaments or live a long way from Rayburn. My Oklahoma buddies, my Arkansas buddies, you guys want to come fish a tournament, this is the tournament to come fish. It's a great payout and you don't have to worry about fishing against local hammers and oddly I finally qualified not to get to fish this. I finally won enough money not to get to fish this this year so I can't fish the average Joe's. All right a couple of other things we want to talk about here. We'll talk about this one again as it gets closer but I just wanted to put this out there so you could put it on your calendar. Uh, Brad, Reagan, uh, Brad Reagan of the uh, Ray Hubbard Bass Club asked me to mention this. So October 27th on Ray Hubbard out of Chandler's Landing. Uh, they're going to have a, a benefit tournament, American Cancer Society, 150 bucks entry fee. It's a team tournament, and there you can see the contact information. But go ahead and put that on your, uh, on your calendar. If at all possible, I will be at that tournament as well. 
Uh, and then a couple of other things that came up from our last video. Some guys had asked about potential donations to the study. Uh, that's the study that begins in November of the 600 fish they're going to tag on the south end of Raven. Uh, Todd says they basically are fine with the number of transmitters they have. They have as many as they feel like they can, can track. They do ask us to do this though. Beginning in November, if you catch a five plus pound fish in the housing area, I think they actually want them out of housing only, on a weekday, and you have time to let them get from Rayburn, which is about a 40 minute drive over there, to come over there and tag that fish, they ask you to please reach out to them at the Park and Wildlife Office there in Brooklyn, Texas, uh, to let them know that you've got that fish and they'll get over there and get that tag so one of your fish can be part of that study. The other question some guys had was, what if I harvest a fish with one of those uh, transmitters in it, what do I do? So there will be an external tag, excuse me, there'll be an external tag on those fish as well that has their phone number on it. So if you catch one of those fish and you decide to harvest that fish, you can call them and they'll come get that transmitter or tell you how to get that transmitter back to them. It would be great if you didn't harvest that fish so they can actually study as many of those fish as they get tagged over that, uh, over that year period. So that's what we got. I think that's everything I wanted to mention today. It is. So a couple tournaments coming up on Rayburn. Again, we've got Labor Day weekend, we've got Average Joe's, and we've got two college tournaments coming up. Going to be a lot of fun. Uh, now this is the last of the Todd Driscoll video. Today he's going to talk specifically about a couple of things the pure oxygen system, and also talk about fish mortality once we get to the weigh-ins and how to avoid that. And we also talk a little bit about the size of fields and tournaments. So I hope you guys enjoy this. Let's jump right to the video right here. Thanks. You know, temperature control is important. So now let, let's move into the most important aspect, and that's that oxygen level. The difference between using an oxygen injection system, which there's not a ton of components. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a small oxygen bottle, a medical grade regulator, hose from the bottle, of course, to the back of your live well to somehow get access, and then a couple of uh, air diffusers. That's it. The difference between that system and, say, run, running your, your, your research pumps, for example, nonstop all day, you're sucking in air, of course, with your research pumps. Air is only 21% oxygen. Of course, the, the oxygen injection, injection system, 100% oxygen. That's one primary difference. Number two, the diffusers that we spec out for these systems are very, very efficient. It's like a small, fine mist of bubbles that's really efficiently used throughout the water. So it's a factor injecting 100% oxygen in the nature of the, of, the, of the fine pour diffuser, making it much more efficient and distributed in that live. Do you have a sense when you're running that what your oxygen levels are in your live well? They're at, at saturation levels and, and above. Okay. If you don't run your pumps, it'll actually get super saturated above those saturation values I talked about. And keep in mind, what, what do we say? At 90 degrees, saturation is 7. The trials that we conducted uh, with Randy down at Lake Falcon, I don't recall the exact data, but it was really hot. And we were above saturation at all times. If you're not running your pumps, let me let, let me get this right, I gotta think about this. Yeah, if you're not running your pumps, it'll get super saturated. If you're running your pumps, it'll drive out some oxygen actually and just keep it at saturation. It really doesn't matter, because at Fish 90 degrees, saturation is seven. Yeah. So you've got anything five plus, it doesn't matter to a bat. Does that actually cool the water when you're running your oxygen system? Does it feel I mean, I, I've never measured it. Okay, I was just curious. Um, all right, so guys are going to be confused because I was. I've got an oxygenator, right? TH right. Marine oxygenator. Tell me that that is not what you're talking about and the difference. Right, the, uh, the oxygenator's been around quite a while. In fact, we, again, we, kudos to Randy Myers, he initiated a lot of these little trials that we conducted. He did the same thing with the oxygenator. He had several boats at his office. I had several boats out here in the parking lot. This was back in uh, 2008, I believe. We evaluated the efficiency of the oxygenator, and that was prior to TH Marine purchase of the oxygenator. And we don't know if there have been any design changes or improvements in it. We've asked them. You haven't, I have. <laughs> but uh, 
The oxygenator is just that, that, that black disc inside your live well wall. And it's just simple electrolysis. Through electrolysis, the water molecule is split. H2O, the water molecule is split. So you've got your oxygen molecules that then combine after they're split with electrolysis to form O2, oxygen gas. That's the theory behind it. Now, our trials indicated, and again, this is oxygenators over 10 years ago. Back then, measuring oxygen, solely running the uh, oxygenator with no pumps running, one, one stagnant live well, for example, with no oxygenator, and another one with no pumps running, the oxygenator running. There was no difference in oxygen content at all. Now, running the pumps in both live wells seemed to help that oxygenator. The one with the oxygenator and a research pump running was, I believe, let me look at the number here. Yeah, 4%. Still a little partial, bit better. Still critical, though. Well, that's not partial per million. That's oh, just that's 4% true. more. I got you. Okay. So they did a little bit better than just pump alone, but not a lot. Oh, just God. 4%. But I can guarantee you. Now, let me let me throw the math at you to make sure I understand that. If I was at five percent, if I was at five parts per million, which is critical, and I increased it four percent, I've made no difference. Practically speaking, it's not much difference. Let's put it that way. Okay. Unquestionably, running that oxygen injection system was far more good, undoubtedly, and we know from those trials that that's the only way that you can maintain saturated oxygen levels under the most extreme conditions. Let's say 85 degrees surface temp and 15 plus pounds of bass in the lab. That's the only way you can do it. What's it cost to put one in your boat? I'd say around 300 high end, maybe less than that. So one of the guys last weekend in the 4th of July tournament out outdoors had a dead fish. One pound penalty cost him $600. That's right. We moved above him because he had a dead fish. It cost mm -hmm. him six hundred dollars. Yeah. So that's if not if not for the conserving our resource, just be greedy and put one in there because you're gonna win. You're gonna cover it in in winnings. If you're oh yeah. Winning yeah. Anything. I mean it's cheap, especially you look at uh, you know entry fee expense and everything like that. Now, do you have to use it all year? No. Below seventy degree surface temps, your pumps are plenty fine if you're running them nonstop. Let me back up a little bit for, for those that may not ever, you know, I wish everybody would go the route of the you know, oxygen injection system, but I know some won't. Mm -hmm. If you're just going to run your pumps, it's absolutely imperative those things run nonstop. Forget the timer. Forget the timer. Turn it off. Now, there's common sense involved. If, the, if, the, if you're out there in January and have a couple 14 inches in there, yeah, on the timer is fine. Yeah. But safe rule of thumb is, let's put it this way, You've got over 10 pounds of bass in there at any point in time in any water temp. You run that pump nonstop. I'm glad you talked about that because you and I are sitting here as guys who've tournament fished for 20 years. A lot of our viewers are guys who may have just bought their first boat because their kids are high school fishing, right? right. And so again, turn the don't don't flip that timer. Just turn it on and let it run. And and I'll tell you guys, I do this in my boat. So I run three big hummingbird units, and they burn some amps. So what I do is when I get up, I turn my back one off because my, this time of year, my live wells run 24-7. Or not 24-7, but the whole time mm -hmm. I'm on the water. So you just conserve your energy where you need to, but not there. That's where you want to run. Right. And you know what? If your batteries aren't good enough, well, you need to get them. Get them. Yeah. That's right. I mean, you just, if you've got 12 plus pounds of bass in a live well at, at 75 degree water, you know, with any kind of sunny day and that live well warming, you know, probably going to get down to that stressful level of oxygen if you're not running them nonstop. All right, so we, we've got that spec'd out. I had it on my website, but anybody who wants that information, get with me. Uh, you've got it. Uh, you, was it your brother that wrote the piece on the oxygen? My brother and Randy Myers. Yeah, my brother works for Randy Myers. So yeah. what would they be able to find that? We are in the process of... Uh, editing that supply list on that uh, shared slideshow. Okay. So once we get that done, and I'll get with Randy next week and try to get that done as soon as possible so you can get a link up. We'll get a link video. up. So I'll have to come back after this video is edited, but I'll put it in the description below so we'll, we'll have the access to that.
But you know, again, you don't have to run that oxygen all year. Right. 70 yeah. degrees is a, is a good ballpark. Anytime over 70, I'm running mine. But uh, a couple of other benefits. Number one, it gets back to, to, to the running the pumps and the battery consumption, the potential noise it creates. What does that do to uh, bass behavior? Mm -hmm. You're running an oxygen system, you don't have to run your pumps. I mean, it's silent. Really? So think you about just, that. You just crank them out and let them go. Yeah. Wow. It, it's weird at first, right? Running yeah. that oxygen and not having your pumps running, but uh, yeah. So you actually shut off to recirculate, keep the same water in there and just run the oxygen? Right. Okay. Yeah, the thing about it is when you're when you're adding ice, you can't continue to add lake water. It just yeah, defeats no. the purpose. Yeah. And historically, we had concerns about ammonia buildup if you're just recirculating and not adding new water, which was a concern concern during summertime terms. Because let's face it, a, a hurdle if you're trying to ice the live well, but then pumping new water in every couple three hours, it's just self defeating. You gotta have a lot of ice. <laughs> Some research that uh, my former advisor in graduate school did, Dr. Hal Schramm, a year or two ago, uh, he dug into the potential ammonia fish waste buildup concerns over a normal term of the day. And what he found that ammonia levels don't get high enough during an eight or nine hour day under any circumstances that he looked at, which gets to the point of, of not being necessary to exchange the water. Again, common sense applies. If you got a fish that really bled a lot in there, or you know, fish regurgitated Does a lot. Does that hurt them when there's blood in the water? I don't guess I exactly know, but common sense just tells me to get some. I do not like looking in there and seeing that. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. But other than those situations, what that tells us is, is we can pump that live well full early in the morning. You put a you put a uh, thing in your overflow so you can completely fill it up. Right. Yeah, yeah I, I plug. It. So, by the way, what we're talking about is a lot of guys, and I do it as well, I carry a, I think it's a one-inch plug or whatever it is, yeah. but just like you used to put in the back of your boat, put it in the overflow on the live well, and that way I can get even more water in there. So, Of course, nine times out of ten out there in the heat of competition, guess what happens? That falls out, I forget about it. No. What? I tell my partner my, or my co-anger, remind me, I've got the overflows plugged. I'm filling the live well up. Well, he's got water at his feet here 10 minutes later. Yeah. yeah. we got a lot of water in here yeah. now, right? Yeah, I've done that too. But no, I, I do plug them. That way I can pump it one time in the morning, get it full, start my process, get the live well cool 10 degrees, and then I don't have to pump any more water in there unless there's, there's bleeding or, or a lot of uh, forage regurgitation, things right. of that nature. Most of the time, it's let ride all day. I mean, his research showed no concern of ammonia buildup. All right, so we know how to get the fish to the way in. Talk to me about fish going into a bag, going up a hill, and standing around for 20 minutes to get weighed. What happens? It's kind of, that brings up a, kind of a, probably a topic of discussion for another day, but you can kind of see fish care split into two components. One is what you and I do from the second that fish is caught until the time we take it to the scales. The other part of fish care is solely on tournament organizers. Now, you and I following the ideal scenario for live well fish care, a poorly designed tournament weigh-in could still kill a lot of fish, undoubtedly. But that's kind of a whole separate, separate topic. To your point, two gallons of water, and, and, and this is uh, Gene Gilliland, current Bass Conservation Director. He used to be a biologist for the Oklahoma Fish Agency. This was uh, some trials that he conducted. He found that with just two gallons of water in there, which that isn't much, but I know you've seen more anglers than what we want to admit, toting up not much water in their bags. I'm 56 and that's a big hill, man. That's, that's... But this is, this is with two gallons of water, 10 pounds of bass, had two minutes before oxygen got to lethal levels. Two minutes. That's just two gallons of water. And only 10 pounds of fish. Right. So. And, and that was at 75 degrees too. Oh, so tomorrow so, at 85 degrees it's. Now that was with two gallons of water, which that's not very much. I mean, I don't know how many gallons of water I put in my bag, but I mean, it about kills me to get them up there. Let's, let's put it that way. But to that point then, and I admit, I've never done this. I should be putting some of that water they have up there that's treated in that bag as soon as I get up there and get some fresh water in there. Well, absolutely. By the way, yeah. I have seen a fish get loose in one of those tanks. Oh, I have terrible. too. I have too. Yeah. But back to the, to the original point, 
the uh, two gallons of water is not much. You put more water in there, there's going to be more time. You're going to have more than two minutes. And that two minutes is based on just running your pumps. Right. You put more water in there and you're running these oxygen injection systems, you've got way, way more time because that oxygen is super saturated. And of course, this is assuming well, you're smart point. enough yeah. to get the water in your bag out of, out of your pump outs and it. not just scoop it right there at the muddy shoreline. Use the live well water you have or run these oxygen systems, and you've got a fair, I'm going to say probably five times that long with four gallons of water and super saturated and oxygen. That's just another reason to run these oxygen systems. But we got to think about how much water is in that bag, what the temperature of that water is, and how long from when you, which by the way, I am one of the guys that gripes when I have to sit after a tournament for an hour to get a weigh bag. But I understand why and it makes sense. There can't be too many way bags. Yeah, that's just a well-designed way, yeah. right? I mean, you can't have more bags than what the holding line tanks will allow. Yeah. And I've seen it more times than I want to admit, and I know that there's countless dead fish. When you've got 15, 20 anglers standing back there with fishing bags, if it's any kind of warm out and can't get to those holding line tanks, that's a death sentence, undoubtedly, based on what we're talking about. And 15 pounds of fish at the same temperature, 75 degrees and two gallons, you have one minute. Wow. It's, it's not mathematically linear, it gets worse. Get more water in those bags, and, and again, running that oxygen injection system, that water super saturated, you've got much, much longer with fish in those bags in terms of, of having good oxygen. It's possible. So, and you, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but this concerns me then when I see tournaments down here with not experienced anglers with four or 500 people fishing. This is where our guys got to step up and say, hey, as a fisherman, yeah, we can go up there and stand in that line, but we need to stay in the boat until that line dies down, right? Absolutely. I've actually informed people as I'm sitting down on the bank. I hear the complaints too. Hey, what the heck's taking so long? Why don't they hand bags out? A responsible tournament director only hands enough bags out to fit the holding line tanks. Worst thing you can do is stand up there in line without access to that holding line tank, number one. And number two, I see far too many anglers at the holding line tanks just standing there with their bag in the water. What's that doing? I mean, just taking the weight off, the, the weight of the bag off of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of your tournaments will have the uh, diffuser yes. stones and the hoses. Put them in there. Put them in there. Yeah. I'll tell you on average, about a third of the people as I'm in a tournament and I'm looking around don't have the stones in their bags. I don't. And I tell them every time. And I don't. I just never thought about it. And just think, when you're not with, without you doing that, that <coughs> length of time, the minutes those fish are in that bag. It won't ever happen again. I've, had, I've now had an education about it. Other tournaments will will transfer the fish into a perforated bag. Right. So that exchange is automatic. Right. But those tournaments where where the exchange isn't automatic, you need to put that diffuser stone in there. Otherwise, the holding line tank, what's it doing? What, what is it doing besides taking the weight off your shoulder? That's about it. You, you got to be cognizant of what's going on there. Should there be a limit on number of boats in a tournament? You know, I'm not going to lay a hardcore line on, on a magical number, but it gets back to the mortality rate we've talked about several times. It's just simple arithmetic. At, at, at any given mortality rate, there's, there's going to be higher total fish deaths in a tournament with 500 boats and 200. Well, and now it's just you, obvious. And, and you've got, I mean, and this bothers me, and I and I struggle with this a lot because, and and I'm and I'm specifically, and I'm going to put it out there. I'm specifically talking about high school tournaments, where because we're getting 500 boats in high school tournaments here, now. and and I'm not asking you to take a position on this, but that's that now puts 100, 200, 300 boats trailered back to the weigh-in site with fish in a live well for a long time, hopefully with the recirc pumps on, and then sitting around for a long time because you can't wait for, and, and look, tomorrow in Bass Champs, if there's 250 guys, 100 of them aren't gonna weigh in because they got three that weigh nine pounds and they know they're not gonna get a check. Basically every one of those kids, if they catch a fish, and I don't blame them. I remember the first time I carried a bag up a hill and how excited I was. But we, we need those tournament organizations to really think about managing those fish waiting to get weighed. And we need you guys 
boat captains thinking about, I need ice in the boat, I need to do every, I need to spend the money. Look, if you just bought, even if you just went and bought a 10 year old tracker, you put six grand in it, spend a few hundred dollars to put the oxygen system in and you'll never kill a fish. Or you've, I heard you killed a fish the other day, but it was deep hooked, right? Yeah. But how many fish yeah. have you killed since you've had an oxygen system in your boat? I guess that's the only one. Or no, uh, two. I had, I had a dead fish cost me a tournament win at Toledo oh. in, a, in a Bassmaster Weekend Series. Glenn Friedman beat me by three tenths of a pound. Friedman won a tournament on Toledo. <laughs> yeah. I, I, didn't, I don't think that's ever happened before, has it? Too many times, I think, <laughs> right? Yeah. But no, that's the only instances, you know, I, don't, I won't even go into the money it cost me that day with that dead fish. But, but yeah, um, and that fish. I swear, we, we talked about the, the potential causes of mortality. Every once in a while, you have something weird happen. In that tournament, that fish, I swear, died of a heart attack or something similar physiological. It was going to be my next cold. It was about 1 o'clock. I never caught another cold. Never looked at the fish again. It's perfectly fine. It wasn't deep hooked. Oxygen system running. It's not oxygen. Temperature cooled. I just died. I've had them die of embarrassment because I caught them. All right, so that, that's my soapbox, on, and, and I, I really want college and high school fishermen to continue having tournaments, but I really want the guys who are running those tournaments to pay attention to, to the potential mortality because a lot of those folks, you know, I, I don't know how many of them are, but a lot of them, it's their first year or two or three years of tournament fish. And so hopefully this, this is helpful. I've learned a ton spending this time with you and I hope you'll do this with me again because these guys are going to have questions I'm going to have questions oh yeah let's uh let's keep this going all right uh, let's uh you know periodically as more questions come in and more ideas I want to talk up. to the geneticists too that'd be fascinating yeah I think that'd be fun to do yeah so, be. yeah uh, so guys thanks for tuning in thank you for spending yeah, time with me yeah. this was yes, your sir. Friday afternoon yeah. uh we will do this again uh I'm not down here a whole lot for the rest of the summer. We got some stuff going on at the house, but I'll be back down this fall and uh, we'll. Guys, if you have more questions that you want to ask Todd, uh, send them to me. Ken Smith Fishing at Outlook.com is my email address, and we'll either address them in comments or we'll address them in another video in the future. Sure. And uh, I now have to go be a guy who gets to shock fish in <laughs> Sam Rayburn in a tournament tomorrow. It just doesn't seem fair. Like we talked earlier, I, I wish that did help me fishing wise. You don't know how many times, years and years ago, we'd go out on a shocking survey, bust them here, bust them there. Again, just shoreline base. Yeah. Go back the next day, an absolute zero. <laughs> <laughs> it happens to all of us. Yeah. All right. Good deal. Thanks, guys. We'll see y'all on the water. Okay, so there you go. That's uh, that's about two and a half hours, three hours that Todd and I spent talking together. Todd, again, thank you so much for that. Guys, if you have questions, as we said, we're going to get together again. So keep coming, keep them coming to me. Uh, you know my email address. It's KenSmithFishingAndOutlook.com. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we're all learning and hopefully enjoying this together. So uh, we'll see you guys this coming weekend, hopefully at the Outlaw Outdoor Tournament on Monday, the uh, Labor Day Tournament. And if not, we'll just be around, and we'll be around for the rest of the fall. Thanks, guys.